In today's tutorial, we'll be creating this particular bubble text effect without using any type of plot simulations. We'll be faking it in geometry nodes and I'll try my best to explain the math behind why we're using every node that we use. With that, let's begin the tutorial. In our default scene, we'll go ahead and change the name of the cube to GeoNode object because we will be using this to apply our GeoNodes on. So we can go ahead and hide it for now and then press Shift A and search for a text object so that we can type whatever text we want. So let's press tab to go into edit mode and just type text or whatever you want. And then I'll just rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Then I'll go to the actual text properties down here and under geometry, I'll go ahead and extrude it by maybe 0.08 to give it some amount of thickness. And I also want to just bevel these edges. So let's just increase the bevel depth to something like 0.05. Now, in case the bevel is causing these to get way too close to each other, you can go down to the character spacing and just increase this by a little bit. And I also want to go to my alignment and change the horizontal to center and vertical to center as well. Apart from that, I want the text to be much larger. So I'll press S5 to scale it up by five units. But I feel like the bevel is a little too much. So let's reduce the bevel depth down to 0.02 and that should be good. Apart from that, I also want to change the font. So I'll expand this font drop down and then select my font from here. In the Windows Fonts folder, I'll just search for Arial Black. Of course, you can use whichever font you want, but I'm going to be using Arial Black. So I'll click Open Font, and this is what we have. So that looks great. And we can now just unhide the GeoNodes object and hide the text object for the time being. With the GeoNode object selected, you can bring your cursor to the junction of these two windows, click and drag to create a new window, and change this from the 3D viewport to the Geometry Node Editor. Then press this plus button to create a new Geometry Node tree. Zoom in, select the group input, and tap X to delete it. And then I'll just take this text from here, click and drag it into the geometry node workspace, and then connect the geometry into the group output. Now you see it's clearly not the same text that we had, and that's because it's on original. To get the actual rotation and scaling in effect, we choose relative, and that way we have exactly what we had. Now, the order of events is going to be placing a bunch of points inside the text, then instancing some spheres onto them. The animation will be the scaling of the spheres, after which we are going to be checking if the sphere or any vertex of the sphere is going outside the actual bounds of the text. And if they are, we're going to push them back onto the surface of the text. So the first thing that we'll do is distribute points within the volume. So let's press Shift A, search for a mesh to volume node, and just plug that in after the geometry. But the problem with the mesh to volume is that if we actually take a look at it, some parts of the volume will be outside the text. So the edge of the E is right here. But if you actually look at the volume, it's clearly going outside the E. And that's why you can't actually read the text or the E and all properly anymore. The first thing to fix that is reduce the exterior bandwidth all the way to zero. The next thing is increase the voxel amount from 64 to maybe 128. And that way you should have a much better representation of text, but there still may be issues here and there. For that, we're actually going to be deleting points after we instance the points within the volume. So let's first distribute points within the volume using a distribute points within volume node. Plug that in right here, and we can increase the density to something like five. And that way we have these points present. Now, just to make sure that none of the points are outside the text, we'll increase the density all the way to something like 365, and then just unhide this text object. So now you can clearly see that there still are points present outside the text. So we'll press Shift A and search for a delete geometry node and plug that in after the distribute points in volume. For the selection, we're going to actually use a geometry proximity and see if any point is present too close to the edge of this text, this will be deleted. So let's press Shift A and search for a geometry proximity node, and then take this geometry and plug it into the target. And that's because we are going to be checking the proximity of each point with this text as the target geometry. The source position is going to be the position of every single one of the points. So let's take this position and plug it in. Remember, the way how geometry nodes works is it always looks from the right hand side and comes in towards the left. So this position is going to give us the position of whatever's on the right hand side. And since we're going to be taking this distance, comparing it to something and then plugging that into the delete geometry, it will be using the delete geometry, which is using these points. So let's press shift A and search for a compare node so that we can compare the distance between these positions and the faces with some value. So let's plug this in here and we want to check if the distance is less than let's say 0.1 meters then they should be deleted. So let's plug this into the selection. And now let's just hide the text object. And this is what we have. 
if we were to start increasing this from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, you can see how we get fewer and fewer points, which means the actual gap between the text and the points will keep increasing. So I think a value of 0 0.2 will be good enough and no point will be too close to the edge. Now we can go back and reduce the density down to maybe 10 again or whatever you feel comfortable with. For now, we'll start with 10 and we might increase that later on because clearly there isn't enough points for the T and things like that. So maybe 20 will do. Then we have to instance some icospheres onto these points. So let's press shift A, search for an instance on points node, plug that in right here. And for the instance, we're gonna search for an icosphere. Now the icosphere radius is going to be far too large. So let's start off by reducing the radius down to maybe 0 0.1. And also they're clearly not smooth so let's increase the subdivisions to something like three or four and to make them look even smoother we'll press shift a and search for a set shade smooth node now this subdivision is very necessary because we're essentially going to be checking every single point over here and if you have a very low number of subdivisions the actual ray cast that we'll be using to push these objects back to the surface of the text will not work too well so if your computer can handle it, you can increase the subdivisions all the way to five, but I'm using a very low-end PC, so I'm gonna use a subdivision of level four. Next, the animation is going to essentially be this scale value, and we want it to always scale by the same number on all three of the axes. So let's control all three of them using a single value by searching for a value node and plugging this into the scale. Now we can change this to maybe 0 0.5 for the time being, and we'll animate this during the animation section. If you actually see an increase of the size, it looks great, but it's not conforming to the shape of the text. If you actually look at the text, clearly these spheres are coming outside the text as well. So the next thing that we have to do is compare every single vertex on these points and check if they are outside this text object. And if they are outside the text object, they have to get pushed back to the surface of this text object. So we can actually test that using a Raycast node, but before that, Remember, since we want control over every individual vertex of this sphere, we need to actually realize the instances because right now they're all instances and instances always act as a whole. They don't act as objects and we don't have control over the individual vertices present within it. So let's search for a realize instances node, plug that in after the instance on points. And now we can go ahead and set position of the vertices that are present outside this particular text. So for that, let's use a raycast node. Let's search for the raycast. And let's see how this works. We need a target geometry on which we're going to be casting rays from every single vertex of these spheres. So the target geometry is going to be this text object. So let's go ahead and take the geometry that has the text object in it and plug that into the target geometry. Now, the ray direction by default is kept at minus one. And that's because usually you want to use this node to check if something is on the ground. So if we have some sort of ground like this and we have some object, we cast a ray in the negative Z direction and check if it is hitting the ground. And we can check this distance to find out how far away it is from the ground and things like that. However, for this particular tutorial, what we need is a sphere like this. And we have, let's say the bound of the text object over here. We need to cast a ray from this sphere or every vertex on the sphere. So the sphere is made up of multiple vertices. We're going to be casting rays outward like this and checking if they hit this particular face. But there's one issue with this, and that is that the Raycast node only works on the positive normal of every face. So what do I mean by that? Let's just take another example. So if I press Shift A and search for a mesh plane and press GY and just rotate it on the x-axis by some arbitrary amount, the face clearly has two sides. It has this face and this other face. And right now you can see both the faces. But if we were to switch on back face culling, you can see that if we look from this side, the face can no longer be seen. And that is how the Raycast node actually works. If we were to have some point here and we cast a ray like this, it will interact with the surface. But if we had the point on this side and we tried to cast a ray, it's not going to hit the surface. and that's actually because it's coming in from the opposite direction. So the ray cannot see this face and it just passes right through without any issues. So that's why we have to make sure that we're hitting it only on the face with the positive normals. Another way to visualize this is going to the overlays and just switching on face orientation. So that way you can see the blue faces are faces that have positive normals. And if you switch off back face culling, you'll be able to see that red faces are wherever the normals are oriented negatively. 
So if we were to just delete this particular plane and look at just the text object, so let's hide the GeoNode object for now, you see the outsides are blue and the insides are red. So if I just zoom in, the inside is red. So if we were to have our spheres in here and cast a ray, it won't be able to notice it. So a workaround to that is actually taking these nodes and instead of pushing them out in the positive direction, we can cast the ray in the negative of the normal so that it goes inward and that way it'll actually hit the surface of the text. So let's see how we can do that. Let's switch off face orientation and just select the GeoNode object. And for the ray direction, we're going to initially use a normal node, which will point a ray out in every single direction. So something like this, from every single vertex, there'll be one normal that's coming out in every direction. But if we use a vector math node, so let's press shift and search for a vector math, and we change this from add to scale, and we scale it by negative one, the normal will essentially be flipped. So now we're going to have normals pointed inward. So they're always going to be facing inside just like this. So that's exactly what we want. Now, this is what we're going to use as the ray direction. And now we have a ray pointed in the inward direction for every single one of these vertices on every single one of the points. We also don't need the ray length to be 100 meters. So let's just reduce that down to 10 and that'll be enough. Now we have the hit position. So if these rays are present or if these vertices are present outside, they're going to hit the face. If they're present inside, you'll realize that they're not going to be hitting the faces because as we saw inside, they're only going to look at the negative face orientation. So the ray is going to pass through freely. So that's why it doesn't matter. And it's going to hit only if they're present outside. Now the hit position is going to give the position where it hit the face. So that is where we want to actually push the vertex to. So if this particular vertex over here had a ray cast in this direction and it hit the surface of the text here, we want this vertex to get pushed to that particular point. So that's very simple. We can search for a set position node. We can plug that in right here. And for the position, we can take this hit position and plug it in. Now you can see everything is getting conformed to the surface and we have the text, but there's one issue. If you hide the text object for now, you see that even the interior of the spheres got pushed outward to that particular surface. And that's because we moved every single point to this particular hit position. We don't want that. We want only the points that were present outside to get conformed to the text. For that, we have to use this selection node and we have to find out if the position was outside. So let's figure out how we can test that. If let's say we had a sphere present over here, so something like that, when we had this ray present outward like that, we scaled it down in the negative axis to point it inward like this. Now, if we actually look at this hit normal, which is the normal of the position at which it was hit, you'd get a vector in this particular direction. However, if you see a point that was present inside the text, like this point, the normal was maybe in this direction. So let's just zoom in so that you can see it even better. So the normal is in this direction. And when we scaled it negatively, the normal is also in this particular direction. So if you take a look at the normals of every single face that's present outside the surface, you'll realize that when we multiplied by negative one, they're essentially going in somewhat the opposite direction as the normal of the face that it hit. So this is the normal of the face that it hit. And this is the normal of the faces that are outside. All of the normals are in somewhat the opposite direction. It doesn't have to be perfectly opposite, but in an opposite direction. On the other hand, every face that was inside is going to have a normal that was multiplied by negative one, which will be towards the same direction as the normal of the face that it hit. So in that case, this direction, this direction, and things like that. So if a vertex is present such that the normal value when multiplied by negative one is in the opposite direction as the normal of the face that it hit, that means it is outside. And those are the points that we want to have the position set. The rest, these points, we don't want it to be set. So how do we do that? We can do that using what's called the dot product. It's a vector math operation and the dot product results in one if the two vectors are in the same direction and negative one if they're in opposite directions. So if you have this as the text vector and you have one vector like this and you have one vector like this, the dot product between this vector and this vector will not be one, but it will be something greater than zero and less than one. If it was the same length or completely the same direction, then the value of the dot product will be one. But this particular 
vector is in the opposite direction. So the value might not be in minus one, but it will definitely be a negative number. So it will be lesser than zero. Hopefully that made sense. I really hope I explained that properly. If you want to have some more intuition about vector math, you can try out these other tutorials where we use simulation nodes, such as this one, where I explain a bit of vector math as well, which might help you in these tutorials. If you have any doubts, definitely comment them down below and I'll try to clarify them as well. So we have this hit normal and we need to compare that with this using the dot product. So let's press shift A and search for a vector math node, switch it from add to dot product. And we're checking the dot product between this hit normal and this particular vector that is the negative of the normal. So this particular value can be greater than zero if they're in the same direction and it can be less than zero if it's in the opposite direction. So let's search for a compare node and just check for less than and plug this in. So if the dot product is less than zero, then I want them to conform to the surface, otherwise not. So let's plug this into the selection. And right now you see we have the spheres in the spherical shape itself if it is not hitting the surface. Let's just reduce the scale from five to maybe two. And there you can see you have nice little spheres if they're not touching the edges. But if they start touching the edges, so maybe a value of three, you can see they start getting squished. So they all hit this edge and they flatten out at this edge. Even here, it's hitting the edge of the T, so it's flattening out. So that is exactly what we wanted. Now, as we increase this scale, they slowly flatten out and conform to the shape of the text. So that's great. Let's just reduce this to three again for now and finish this off. To finish this node tree, let's press Shift A, search for a set material, plug that in right here and choose the default material as of now. Then let's set all of our defaults, then deal with the texturing and finally the animation. So let's go to our render properties, switch on ambient occlusion, expand this, increase the distance to something like 10, increase the factor as well to something like five so that we have quite a lot of ambient occlusion. Let's switch on screen space reflections and expand this and switch on refraction as well because we will be using a glass material for the text object. Then let's go to our output properties, change the frame rate to 30 frames per second, end frame can be 150, so that it's just a five second long animation. Output folder can be whatever you want it to be. File format, we can choose FFmpeg video, encoding will change from Matroska to MPEG4, and output quality will choose Perceptory lossless. Then we'll go to the world properties and change the background all the way to the brightest white, and we'll switch our viewport shading from solid to rendered so that we can actually see what we have. Then let's switch this from the geometry node editor to the shader editor and we'll rename material from material to text spheres or something. It's really up to you. If you don't see the nodes, just press period on your numpad to centralize all the nodes. And if that doesn't work, just tap A to select all the nodes followed by period on your numpad. Then let's change this base color to maybe a slightly bluish color like that. And I'll also make it completely as bright as it goes. I'll also increase the roughness all the way to one. That's actually enough for my spheres. The next is going to be my text object. So let's just unhide the text object and then select it. Once you've selected it, you can come here and press new to add in a new material. We'll call this glass text and we'll go ahead and select the principal BSDF and tap X to delete it. Then I'll press shift A and search for a glass BSDF and I'll plug this into the surface. Now to actually make this look like glass, I'll go to the material properties, change the blend mode from opaque to alpha blend, switch off show back face and switch on screen space refraction. And that way we now have this glass object present outside our spheres. We can hide the overlays and this is what we get. Due to the bevel, you get these nice reflections and things like that, which seems good. The next thing is the actual animation. So there's two things that have to be animated. One is the actual size of the objects and the other thing is the camera. So let's go back to the GeoNode object, switch back to the geometry node editor, go to frame one, and on the value, let's reduce this to something like 0.5 and just tap I. And then let's go to frame, let's say 120 and we'll increase the value to something like four and then we'll tap I. After that, we'll select this node, come down here, press T linear, just to make it grow in a linear fashion. But of course, if you want it to be smoother, you could keep it at Bezier. Then let's select our camera, press Alt G to clear location, Alt R to clear rotation. To actually see the camera, let's just switch on our overlays again. Then we'll press RX90 to rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees. Then GY will allow us to move it back on the y-axis. And then we can press zero on our numpad to go into the camera view. Now we'll press RZ to just rotate it towards the side and then press GX to move it back. And also to see nothing outside the camera view, let's go to our camera properties, expand viewport display and increase passport out all the way to one. 
I'll just press GY to move it back a bit, GX to move it here. And then on frame zero or frame one, I'll go ahead and tap I, location, rotation, scale. Then by around frame 80, let's just go GX and move it to this edge of the text and then press I, location, rotation, scale. Then by about frame 110, we'll just press Alt G, Alt R to clear location and rotation again. Or X90 will rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees. GY will just bring it back till we have the entire text within our camera frame. Then I'll press I, location, rotation, scale. Now, if you actually look at it, I don't like the way this rotates. So halfway through, I'm just gonna press GX and bring it back by a bit and then press I, location, rotation, scale. Then on frame 140 as well, I'll press I, location, rotation, scale. Then I'll switch this from the timeline to the graph editor so that we can actually smoothen out the actual motion. So right now, if we were to hide the GeoNode object and switch to solid view, let's enable global disable as well and just switch it off so that nothing is rendered. You can see that there's a slight weirdness in this motion when it does that. So I don't really want that. I want it to be nice and smooth. So I'll go ahead and press Alt Shift O to sample keyframes and then press Alt O multiple times to nicely smooth and everything out. So I'll go with maybe 35 iterations. And that way we should have a very nice smooth motion of the camera. So even this motion will be nice and smooth and we get that. So that looks great. Let's go ahead and enable the GeoNode object once again, switch over to the viewport shading of render. And this is the animation that we have. Now, the last thing that would be required is a background. So let's press Shift A, search for a mesh plane, or X 90 to rotate it on the X axis by 90 degrees and then press S and just type in a large number. Let's go with 100 and then GY to just move it back by a little bit. Then let's give it a new material by switching this over to the shader editor. Press this new to add in a new material. And I'm just going to increase this color all the way to the brightest white and give it maybe the opposite of the blue. So maybe some type of a peachish color like this. Beyond that, I'm gonna take this light, increase the power to maybe 10,000, make it much brighter but I'm going to also increase the radius to something like 10 meters to make it a lot softer as well. You can always add in some HDRIs to the background to give some more reflections to the glass object. But I think for this animation, this is good enough. And this is the effect that we have. The best part about this particular method is that you can always select the text object and just change it to whatever you want. You can press tab to go into edit mode and change this to any new text, maybe ABCD or some other name that you might have. And it just automatically works with that as well. So that is the best part about this. And I think that's really useful. It doesn't even have to be the same number of letters. You could just as well have a single letter that you could use as a logo or whatever you want. In fact, you could type in logo as well. Essentially, once you're happy with your final animation, the text and whatever you have, all you have to do is press render animation. I really hope you enjoyed that tutorial and you learned something useful from it. If you found that one useful, I have multiple videos on text animations as well in this playlist that you can check out. Otherwise, you can always check out other videos on my channel for simulation nodes, geometry nodes, and general inspiration. I have hundreds of videos because I upload one video every single day. Once again, thank you so much for watching this far into the video. The watch time really helped me. Until the next video comes out tomorrow, good luck with creating and definitely stay creative.